today on No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. And, 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 and you and I could learn this, or we could recognize this from Scripture, is that envy, it causes that inward pain when we see somebody else succeed. Think about that. It, it, it's that inward irritation, if you will, that, are, that erupts within us. And what does it lead to? It leads to the element of wrath. That envy, that inward pain when we see somebody else succeed. And this is what was happening with the brothers, man. They looked upon him, Joseph. He's the younger guy. He's 17 years old. He's got this special coat. Now he's having these, these dreams from God. And they're not happy about this at all. They're ticked off. And so that envy is there. When it's simple, he showed his love, taking the cross. Welcome to No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. Our study in Genesis picks up today with the story of Joseph. Throughout his life, we see a man who endured great difficulty and pain, even though he had a heart to follow and obey God. Whether it was being rejected by his brothers because of envy and jealousy, and having his family torn apart when they sold him into slavery, or being falsely accused by his boss's wife and getting thrown into prison because of it, Joseph always had the encouraging reminder that God was with him. Even in the midst of darkness and the depths of despair, he always trusted in the sovereign hand of God, knowing his love would never fail. At the end of his life, Joseph could confidently make the bold declaration to those who hurt him, you intended to hurt me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. And now, here's Pastor Jeff as we continue our study through Genesis. Shouldn't do that, and I can learn here. Yes, all that stuff is true, but the big picture is all about salvation and what God is up to. And so, as we capture that big picture, I want us to dive into chapter number 36. Turn to chapter 36 there. And, and, and uh, if you look in your Bible at chapter 36, you, you can see there's a verse one, and you can see that there's a verse number 43. Would you agree? Flip your Bible to agree. You have to test everything. <laughs> Always test it. So there's 43 verses there in the middle of this. Now, now, if you have an awesome Bible, or you have a workable Bible, I should say, is there a title over the top of chapter 36 in your Bible? Something to the effect of, of alluding to maybe the genealogy of Esau and Edom. Yes? Okay, so we have a big picture. Or you have a big picture there before we dive into it. And I, I want you to understand that that's exactly what's taking place, that, that, that we're offline here. Now, who, uh, Esau is the brother to who? To Jacob. And Jacob was a heel catcher. Jacob, Jacob was a manipulative guy. Jacob is a guy that wrestled with God, and, and his name was changed from Jacob to what? To Israel. And, and the 12 sons come, or the 12 tribes come. They're his sons. They come from his, his line, from his blood there, if you will. And so... In chapter 36, we're dealing with Esau, but, but in looking at him, he's one of Isaac's sons, but he's not the covenant character. He is not Joseph. He's not the main guy, and yet God still does something special here by, in chapter 36. We still see what's going on, and so again, just use this as one of those examples that he is a character that the Bible mentioned, but, but it does not follow him through. And so what do we have about uh, Esau right here? What, what do we see within this chapter? Well, we see his wives. We see his sons. We see that there are chiefs. We see that there are kings. There's, there's, there's just a representation of what came from him. And in this chapter, here's the, here's the main thing. I want you to capture this, that, that Esau, that he's noted five different times as being the father of the Edomites within this chapter. That means something to us. Again, He's mentioned five times as being the father of the Edomites within these 43 verses, the sons, the chiefs, the kings of Esau. And, and what is taking place is that God is clearly establishing the division between Jacob and Esau. Because what took place? Well, the fight started all the way back in chapter 25. Chapter 25, verses 22 and 23, in Rebekah's womb, we remember when we were there that there were two nations at, at war within her womb. These two brothers... Jacob and Esau, the, the, the battle was happening there. And, 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 and poor Rebecca, she's like, oh God, what's going on? This is not right. And God's the one that speaks the word, Genesis 25, verse 22 and 23. The God's the one that speaks the word and says, hey, in your belly, there's two nations. 
Well, these two nations here, we're, we're seeing this. We have, uh, again, the patriarchs um, that, uh, that, that come through uh, Jacob, and, it, and it we'll move on to Joseph next. But Jacob and Esau here in this, Esau is the father of the Edomites. And, and, and if, we, if we could just look at it this way, we can consider it faith versus the flesh. Because old Esau, Mr. Harry there, okay, uh, what, what, was his, what was his inclination? That he was always going after something in the field. He loved the hunt. You know, you know, getting game was his deal. And he sold his birthright, you guys remember that, to Jacob, who was a little bit more delicate on the edges there. And he turned it in, the passing pleasures of the moment. So we find that in the comparison between these two sides. When we come to Esau and we're dealing with Jacob, we, just, we can just understand these things very simply that we have faith versus the flesh. Jacob, faith, Esau, flesh. And here's the point of wisdom. In Proverbs 10 and 7, you'll see it on the screen here. It says that the memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. And, and for Esau... He gets 43 verses here. And, and, and Jacob's not really mentioned through, through this a lot. But what happens is that in the fullness of the scripture, Esau is mentioned about a total of 200 times, whereas Jacob is mentioned more than 2,000 times. Now, let me read the verse back to you again. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7. You'll see it on the screen one more time. The memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. And, and that's it that his character has gone off the scene as we move through this chapter. And so we, we're going to recognize that the impact of those with, without God, that their impact upon this world, there might be chiefs, there might be kings, as you're seeing in, in, in chapter 36, that might come from a particular lineage, but it's only temporary. And by the life of the person that is saved, their memory is blessed how many people within the faith do we reflect back onto today? People that we, we may not even read about them. We may not even know much about them, but, but, but we can just mention and remember their name from afar. All of these tremendous people, uh, men of faith, women of faith that have added to the kingdom of God. That's the idea there. And so as we go through the rest of the Bible, let's understand this, that coming from Esau, we have uh, Edom. He's the father of the Edomites, okay? And so Edom is mentioned uh, as is Israel's enemy. And we even see that King David, that even during his time of being a king, uh, that he rises to that place to having a wars with the Edomites. This all came out under Esau. Uh, these are all the people. And maybe, maybe the final thing that I would mention here about chapter 36 before we spring forward here is this, maybe just a fun little fact, is just see if we can kind of uh, put the uh, pieces together in your mind of what you already know. Let's remember this is that Petra was a notable city of Edom, okay? Uh, and and uh, if you ever want to go on an extension tour with me to Israel, uh, well, Petra is that place to visit, okay? So sometimes we could do that before or after uh, that. And so, uh, it, you know, uh, like I said, it, there's a lot of things to, to learn in Israel. If you've gone once, well, you just scratched the surface. You really need to go three, maybe four times to, to really absorb that comprehensive understanding of, of what you're seeing as you walk uh, in Israel, as you walk the Holy Land and so forth. And so, again, Petra was a notable city there of Edom. Now, in the Bible, we don't have the word Petra that is used. It actually goes by the Hebrew name Selah, S-E-L-A. Uh, you find that mentioned. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 16, verse 1, and also in 2 Kings 14, verse 7. Now, both of the words, whether it's Petra or Selah, the Hebrew word Selah, is, is they, they both mean the same thing. It means rock, and it describes this city that was carved in the sandstone cliffs there. And so Petra, or Selah, uh, it sits about 50 miles south of the Dead Sea. And that means something to those of you that have, been to, that have traveled to Israel with me. And so you can kind of wrap your mind around all of that. And so I would leave that as the finality there of dealing with Esau, who's the father of Edom, the Edomites, the people group. And you have something to attach to it, that rock city, Petra, is what we often call it here today. Now let's spring ahead. Let's move into chapter 37 now as we drill down a little bit farther. Now, now perhaps we move into the meat of our study here for tonight and we come to, uh, again, just recognizing that the focus is shifting here. It's, it's, it's turning and it's moving from Jacob and it's, it's, it's getting dialed into Joseph. And, and as that happens, 
we got one idea, first idea here, and that is reasons for suffering. What we are going to find is that the reasons for suffering that show up in Joseph's life right here is that preparation was the name of the game. And, 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 and I really do love this about God. And, and let's see what we can learn from the scriptures as we go through this. But God was, he was going to use Joseph and, and, and God actually reviewed, uh, revealed it to Joseph. And he revealed it to him when he was in his teenage years. So there was a little bit of, um, could we say a little bit of haughtiness, maybe a little bit of a lack of wisdom, the way that, that Joseph was sharing that uh, with his brothers and even with his, his family. And so Joseph didn't always act in a place of, of wisdom and, and humility. And, and in fact, as a teenager, he probably was doing some of these things in a different way, but he was still communicating truth of what God was doing. God was giving him a dream. God was doing these things. And, 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 and uh, Joseph begins to understand that, wait a minute, God's up to something. Now, we know that Jacob, his dad, gave him this coat uh, as, as one of the younger sons. He was second to the youngest uh, of, of all the sons. And, 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 and we know that, that his dad, Jacob, he gave him this special coat. It's called a coat of many what? Many colors. You guys are very well Bible read in that. And so there was, a, there was an indication there. And you can, you can read commentary on this thing. And, and this guy will tell you that. And that person will tell you another thing here. But the, but the general idea is that he was set apart and he was special in that. And there was something noteworthy about it. Because it was like an over, over the top type of thing. I mean, if you see me come walking in here. Uh, actually, I wouldn't do this because this is way out of my character. Uh, but, but if Doug came walking in here with a big old white polar bear fur coat, right? And he's pimping these big old shiny glasses and everything. We would know that, boy, that guy thinks there's something going on or something, you know? Um, it, it, all that to say is that, that if we can just understand that with the coat. Again, God was doing something. God was speaking to him. But, but there, was, there was something there. And so he, maybe he was a little bit entitled in certain areas. And so God had to do something here, and he, he had to allow these character lessons along the way. And they're, they're wonderful lessons, right? Yeah, we also know that as we study the scripture that, that Joseph is a guy as often that is, you know, you often uh, do character studies. You see Joseph in Christ and all that stuff. He's not Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. He's, the, you know, uh, the God man or 100% man, 100% God, I should say. But, but we, can, we can understand just in general by looking at his life that as a teenager, all this stuff was given, and, and, and God wanted to teach him. God wanted to prepare him. And so the lessons of preparation, when you read chapter 37, I'm encouraging you to read that and understand the big picture of preparation and then apply that to your own life of how God is preparing and he's, he's working in your life to lead you into his plan. Let's read verses one through 11. Genesis 37 verse one says this, it says, now Jacob, he, he dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Now this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the, the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. So Joseph is kind of out there. He comes back as a little tattletale type of guy, okay? Uh, not sure what is said. This is just the only thing that we have right here within Scripture. Verse 3, it says, Now Israel, this is Jacob, Israel, he loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and they could not speak peaceably to him. Now, Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. And so he said to them, please, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. And now, now Joseph starts telling the dream. He says, he says, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheep stood all around and bowed down to my sheep. He's not winning points by sharing this dream there. Not at all. And it says, verse 8, it says, And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have uh, dominion over us? And so they hated him even more. That's the second time that we see this. For his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream, and he told it to his brothers, and he said, look, I have dreamed another dream, and, and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. And so he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? So your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down 
uh, to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. God bless our understanding into your word here. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we're moving along and we're talking about reasons for suffering, we're seeing the character of Joseph come on the scene. We've seen a little bit of trouble. We understand that, that this is said as one of the last sons of Jacob, one of the youngest sons of Jacob, second to the last. And we understand that he's 17 years old and we understand that in that, God is beginning to speak to him. He's giving him these dreams. And, 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 and what God was doing, again, it's a preparation for what lies ahead. That, that wisdom, that humility, all of that stuff is being learned as a teenager, and so as we, as we move through this, we see a couple of dreams that were there, okay? Uh, we recognize in verse number four the reason that Joseph's brothers hated him. And then we, we, we drop into verses five, six, and seven. We see this first dream, okay? The first dream is about the sheaves and all that stuff. And, and, and we know in, in, uh, by, by reading through Genesis, we know what lies ahead and how God is going to use him to save the country from starvation and all that during the time of the famine and how it will impact his, his father and his brothers and all that stuff. A very special thing that God is lining up, but it's a dream. And he was very passionate about that. And maybe God put something upon your heart and you get very passionate about that. And, and you're not quite sure exactly the timing or how to communicate that to others. Well, this is an example of, of Joseph as a teenager. And then he rolls into that second dream, verses eight, nine, and 10, and often you hear this particular dream talked about a lot more, and then you begin to, to hear you know, all of these theories come into play. I just want to tell you, you guys are Bible students, most of you are Bible students. Uh, I, I just want to tell you, remember what we have learned over the course of time, not, not only here in this fellowship, but as we've, we've been in the body of Christ, we learned that if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense lest you come up with what? Nonsense. We've learned that. And, and, and we've learned along the way that when I'm going through a passage of Scripture, that it is a great idea. I got glasses on. They help me have what type of vision? 2020 vision. That it's a wonderful idea to consider 20 verses before and 20 verses afterwards when I get into a struggling text to see if there are any clues that are attached there within this. And so when we look at this, this second dream here, use your eyeballs on your Bible there. And, and you see here at the end of verse number 9, the uh, middle of verse number nine, he says, I, I, he says, I have a dream. Uh, it was another dream. He says, and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Uh, and so again, he told it. Now, as we continue to read on in this, we see there at the end of verse number 10, that Jacob speaks up and he says, shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? Again, direct contents uh, context is right here in verse 9, verse 10, direct context of what's going on. The sun, the moon, the 11 stars. I think they'll flash this on the screen for you if, if, should you desire to write it down. The sun is dealing with nothing more than dad. This is Jacob. That's all it is. We don't have to go to this place and to, to, you know, to allegorize this or spiritualize it and do all these crazy things. We'll just read it within its context. Verse 9, he says it. Verse 10, it's defined. Very simple. God's like that. Uh, again, with the, with the moon, uh, this is mom. And the 11 stars, uh, these are the brothers. Joseph, Joseph will be counted in, in, in this dream here as, as brother number 12, if you will. And so that mystery is interpreted for us so that we can walk away with a general understanding of what's going on. Now, I want us to notice here, as we take that and we move forward, I want us to notice the result. Uh, look at verse number 11, okay? It says, and his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Let me give you a different translation on that for the father's side, for Jacob. If you use the NLT for this, it says that, speaking of, of Jacob, his dad, that, that he wondered what the dreams, plural, meant. That, that in other words, that he heard his son saying these things and he gave a response and he could see that the, the brothers were upset and all that stuff. But in Jacob's heart, he's going, what does this mean? What is God up to? He kept the matter there within him. But his brothers, well, his brothers envied him. And, 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 and you and I could learn this, or we could recognize this from Scripture, is that envy, it causes that inward pain when we see somebody else succeed. Think about that. It, it, it's that inward irritation, if you will, that, are, that erupts within us. And what does it lead to? It leads to the element of wrath. That envy, that inward pain when we see somebody else succeed. And this is what was happening with the brothers, man. They looked upon him, Joseph. He's a younger guy. He's 17 years old. He's got this special coat. Now he's having these, these dreams from God. And they're not happy about this at all. They're ticked off. And so that envy is there. And 
What do we know about malice? Well, malice, it, it produces the inward satisf satisfaction when we see somebody else fail. Because malice is that nasty attitude that wants to do evil and to harm somebody else. So understand what we're looking at there. Now spring ahead to verse number 18. Remember, this is our flyover. We're just putting the pieces together here. Uh, verse number 18, it says, Now, when they saw him, this is Joseph, afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to love on him. What does it say in your Bible? To kill him. So you can see how that envy, they envied him. This is, what, this is what we just got done reading. In terms of their response to these things in verse number 11, they envied him. And that malice popped up within him. Hey, listen, they were so ticked off on the inside that he was doing this stuff. And again, it rises to that point where that malice sets in. And, and they're, they're, they're plotting here to do him harm. Second idea of the night as we begin to work our way towards a, a close here. Idea number two, the road of suffering. Okay, so we have the reasons for suffering and what we've been able to see just in the, in the small portion so far is that, that practically God has a plan, that he was preparing Joseph for something. That's why the dreams came. Even at 17 years old, he's preparing him. It's never, too, it's never too early to prepare our children to follow the Lord. And now that second idea is, and this is the road of suffering. Okay, so, so Joseph started this difficulty here uh, as it's recorded for us, about 17 years old, verse number two told us that. And now on this road of difficulty, this road of preparation, that he walks down this road for 13 years before it finally comes to pass. And what you and I should understand is, is that suffering is common for us as the people of God. That God is the one that prepares us for the next step within our life. And hold this within your heart, is that after suffering, there's seasons of fruitfulness that often surpass the level of suffering. You know, that is a really encouraging point. That is something that, that again, as we survey the scriptures, that we can see what Satan means for evil that God uses for good. That we, that we can see in the framework of the weakness of our life that, that our God is working something else out behind the scenes. That there is preparation that is there. Uh, there, you know, there is, uh, there's hardship to walking as a Christian for sure because God wants to keep us alive. He wants to keep us in this place of, of um, uh, what's the best way to say this, um, that we're relatable to other people because if all God did was just showered us with, with these temporal blessings in the moment, what happens? Our hearts get fat. Our, 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 our suffering component, we, it's like, uh, you know, we, you know we, we push off of that. We don't want no part of this. And, and, and it makes us so unrelatable. And, and I can tell you that, that as a Christian, I've, I've had those seasons in my life. As a young Christian, as a middle Christian, even maybe, even maybe as a Christian here today, uh, you know, that, that, you, that you go and, and, and you find yourself enveloped in the great love of God and things are just going well. And it's like, oh man, this was a, a fabulous year and this was, you know, a fabulous season and all of that stuff. And, and you know, in those, those places, because our hearts are so deceptive, we can rise to this place of, of just, you know, having this obnoxious pride. This is what Joseph was like to his brothers. He had that obnoxious pride within him. Uh, you know, and he, he probably didn't mean to go out there and tick his brothers off like that. But the reality of it was is that's just what happened. And God uses the external situations there. Uh, God's not the one that planted the envy. God's not the one that planted the malice. God's not the one that, 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 that led them along to try to kill Joseph. Uh, we're not saying that. Scripture's not telling us that, but we can see what the enemy means for evil, that God uses it for good, and he used it to shape Joseph. Because when you rise to a position of power, he comes as second in command over Pharaoh, right? We're gonna see this in the days ahead. But, but, but as that happens there, God shapes a leader so that the leader has touched not only with God, but reality, so that he doesn't become haughty and self-seeking and forgets the people and all of this stuff. We see that in, 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 we see that in real time across whether it be our nation or other nations, uh, you know, where, where, where leaders reach that point of such power and they, they, they lose the scope and the vision for what's really going on with the common people. That's all for today. Join us for our next broadcast of No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer, weekdays at 10.30 a.m. No Greater Love is an outreach ministry of Westminster Calvary and is supported by listeners like you. If you would like to partner with us, please text any dollar amount to 84321. We would like to personally invite you to join us for our weekly worship services Sundays at 8 or 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. 
We are located in Westminster, Colorado, on the northeast corner of Church Ranch and Wadsworth Parkway, near the Vasa Fitness. If you're not local, tune into the weekly live stream on our web campus, app, Roku, or on Apple TV. Have you downloaded the free Westminster Calvary app yet? You can stay up to date on coming events, join a small group, request prayer, and watch live worship services. Just search Westminster Calvary on your favorite app store today. Lastly, we're a church that's ready to serve you. If we can do so, give us a call at 303-223-4640. And remember, there's no greater love than when Jesus gave up his life for you and me. Thanks and God bless. Taking the cross.